Yep, that's the Gypsum's Malort. All right, which one do you want to be? We've got the Wolfman, the Mummy, Dracula, and Frankenstein. I want to be the Wolfman. You got it. I guess I'll be Frankie. Matt, would you like one? We'll okay. try some Malort. You got Dracula Chicago. and the Mummy. I'll take Dracula. Right, there we there go. go. Yeah, poor old mummy. He's always in my And the Muddy Roots uh, group, they were talking about this so much. And when yeah, I was there, I was like, right? I was like, I gotta get some and try it, bring it back, and get everybody else to try it. What is it? Malort. Well, I'm gonna tell you, James told me it, it tasted like earwax. <laughs> well, like I said, I tried it with I my brother. That smells like uh, hand sanitizer. And <laughs> it might be a good idea to have a chaser. Yeah, that's why I brought. You. I brought my flask just in case. Right, I brought. Well, you need to get it on film. This thing. We're here, whatever. Oh, I'm rolling it down. Oh, you're already rolling? So you're yeah. just going to edit this right. out. All right, gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. All right. Hey, everybody, this is DIY Live. Woo! Woo! We're trying Malort. Malort! Malort! All the way from Chicago? I didn't taste it all on the way down, but like, once it lingers. It's afterwards. Ooh. It's almost like vapor rub or something. I don't know what it is. I thought it reminded me kind of like an IPA. You know how the first oh, sip yeah. is okay, but then the more you drink, you're like, oh my gosh, this is awful. I feel like a hipster douchebag would call this grapefruit. <laughs> oh, yeah, you know, kind of grapefruity. That's true, because it's got that, yeah. What kind of liqueur is it? Uh-huh. It's made in Chicago. What? They what kept it? talking about it. And all it says is Carl Jepson Company, Chicago. Yep. Has the aroma, hang on. Oh, I'm sorry. Has the aroma and full bodied flavor of an unusual botanical. Botanical? Doesn't say which botanical. Yeah, it doesn't say a damn thing about what it tastes like. There's some no. fucked up botanicals. I don't think they tried to taste like anything. Yep. Uh, Aftertaste is. That's what gets you is that afterwards. Good. It's not the most horrible thing I've ever drank. I bought a bottle in this lifetime, and I think that that's plenty. Yeah, yeah. I agree. I've tried it. So I've tried it. Yep, tried the Malort. All right. Well, hey everybody. I'm Selena Brilla, and this is DIY Live, Huntsville, Alabama's YouTube channel dedicated to capturing the underground. And we are here as always at the Fret Shop. And today I'm with Alabama Sharp, Donnie Sharp. Doesn't matter which one we call you. Nope. Call me whatever you want. I suppose Alabama Sharp's Go Go Killer singer. Donnie is people that know me. D Sharp's another band. Sharp I mean whatever, but uh, just. I'm a multifaceted person. That's fantastic. And uh, I take it you are from right from Alabama. Yep, I was born and raised here, unlike most folks. I mean, uh, so my family came here. They were farmers and religious people. Jackson Way Baptist Church, not far from here, was founded by my great grandfather. So that's kind of background from where I came from. Uh, that's a big church here, the yep. Jackson Way Baptist Church. Yeah, mm -hmm. and that is a big, big thing here. Alrighty, so we brought you here today because we want to talk to you, the psycho singer of the Go Go Killers. I've gone to tons of your shows, and Matt has too. We've seen you play a lot. Uh, let's talk about that first. Let's talk about the Go Go Killers. When was that formed, and how did it come about, and being a psycho singer? Okay. Well, I hadn't been in a band for a long time, and I really didn't have a lot of interest in it anymore. I felt like I'd already done enough and had established you know, some background that was okay, and to just leave it at that. But I did have friends that would ask me periodically, well, let's do this, let's do that, and there was really nothing that interested me. But then, like, when um, Lux Interior passed away, I mean, it's kind of like everybody probably has different bands or different bands they like most of their life growing up. And you yeah. really look at them as invincible. You don't think of the fact that at some point these folks are going to pass away or can. And that kind of just really, you know, hit me pretty hard. Because the last time we had an opportunity to go see them was somewhere in Tennessee, and it was in the middle of winter. And so we basically just decided, well, we'll go see them the next time they're in the area. And there wasn't a next time. And so you're just like, I can't believe that there's a world where the cracks don't exist anymore. And then realizing, well, that's going to happen to Glenn. It's going to happen to all these people at yeah. some point in time. You're like, that was, that was really a big wake-up call to me. And so I was pretty depressed about it. And I basically just went back and did a deep dive into the cramps. And I listened to everything they had, everything that they had recorded, all their influences. And I really spent like a year or two just digesting all that. And I was looking at it in terms like I never got to do my flat out rock and roll shit. So I thought, well, all right, well, here's what I'm willing to do. I can take this from my perspective, not, not the cramps, but the influences they had. A lot of it was Southern music anyway, blues and rockabilly. I said, I can do that, but that's really the only thing 
that I haven't done that I'm willing to do. So, uh, and I was talking to Russ, who uh, plays guitar with us. He was actually a bass player. He's probably one of the best bass players there's ever been in this area. He's just a thunderous monster on the bass. But I was like, all right, well, why don't you just switch over to guitar? I mean, we're going to do this very primitive. And so we just wrote and banged out some songs. And, you know, to me, it was all pretty just ridiculous and over the top. And I look at it as far as the term psycho singing. I look at that as like old Charlie Feathers or Hassel, Atkins, stuff like that. Nobody does anything like that anymore, so I just took it to how I could interpret it and do it, which is, you know, it's not mimicking them, it's just doing it my own way. And just, we just kind of went from there. We hollered it at the time. You know, I discovered Cancer Slug, they'd been around here a while, but like my son had been in bands, he was in Bare Knuckles, some other hardcore bands, and I had interpreted hardcore at that point as just being a lot of MMA moves, people on the floor, you know, we're going to line over here and knock everybody down. Like, I've gotten old, I went into that shit, you know, because we'd, We'd done the slam dancing, done the stuff for years, so so I kind of thought, well, that's what that is. And then I went and saw uh, Cancer Slug on Halloween, maybe in 08 or something like that, because I just wanted to oh, I'll go check out Mike's band. And I was pretty well blown away, because I was like, wow, so this is a world where we can coexist with that. You know, like, we don't belong with these flat-out hardcore bands, but as far as rock and roll stuff, I mean, like, I was astonished that something like that, like them, even existed in the town I was from, that even Mike, who I'd known since he was a kid, had, had molded into that. So anyway, we played and we just kept going and, you know, I'm pretty prolific. I mean, once I start doing something, I'm, like I mentioned to you, I don't live in the past, I live in the now. And I, don't, I don't focus on the past a lot. I just look at always, you know, you're the tip of the spear, you're moving forward, you know, that's the direction you're going. And I'm pretty relentless in that regard. I mean, like we played last weekend in Nashville. I mean, I loved it. It was a great fucking time, but it always, all, already seemed like that was months ago. Mm -hmm. You know, like I'm looking, what's next, what's next, what are we going to do when we record, what songs are we going to do, what's next. And that's kind of what the Go-Go Killers are. I mean, really, we're trying to bring back an experience in music where there's, uh, you know, some bands, they record something, they're not even recording at all at the same time. It's just done in cycles or whatever. We record everything in one take at the same time, just like people did at Sun Studios, you know, decades ago. And we don't look at anything that we're doing live as a recital. We look at it all as it should be spontaneous chaos to some extent. It should be like a total freak show. It should get out of control. And if it doesn't, to me, then that's fucking boring. There's nothing worse to me than going to see a band and I could have stayed home listening to the CD, you know, I could have just hit them on whatever. I mean, yeah. like, whatever. That's what you do. So you're standing there playing there. I'm supposed to be impressed by that. I mean, I'm not. I want, to, I want it to be fun. I want to be entertained. And I look at it as if I can go out there and say we play fucked up music for fucked up people. If I can go out there and all the people that don't belong in the world take time out of their lives to come see us because they know we're all under this umbrella and I see them smiling and having a good time for 30 minutes or an hour then I look at it, I did something I did something to help all these people that nobody gives a shit about you know, like, that's Absolutely. how I look at it and so it's like I don't I don't give a shit about the money I mean we, we, we get paid a little bit here and there but we've spent you know thousands of dollars compared to what we've made and we'll continue to do that but it's just because that's what we're going to do man like uh Sometimes people get on to me or, you know, come at me with shit like, you're not doing this, you're not doing that. It's like, I don't fucking care, man. I'm going to do what the fuck I want to do. I mean, there's no way to change me. You can kill me, I guess, but that's the only way you're going to stop me from doing what I want to do. And that's kind of what the go-go killers are. We really just want to have fun. We want to have, we just want the people that don't belong, come. You belong with us, man. I don't fucking belong either, man. Our whole band's like that. And we will. It's You ain't going to see no recital. Every show we do is unique. We have probably 80 songs at this point. So we look at everywhere we're playing to go, what's the venue? Who's the crowd? Who are we playing with? What's the best songs that will be the most fun for that show? And then that's how we set up a show. We've, we've never done the same show twice and probably never will. But that's kind of the go-go killers. And that's the whole thing of the, of the psycho singer. I look at there's nobody that I know of that does you know what I do as far as singing anyway. It's not singing, it's just... Religious shit to me, but right. go ahead. And the, uh, no, I want to talk about the exercise, the demons. Yeah, yeah. Because that happens during your shows where somebody will get down and then it'll, it becomes like a religious experience for a moment. Yeah, I mean, that's maybe really... Even though it's not a recital, maybe a little uh, revival. Yeah, I mean, it is. I mean, like, uh, I won't get too deep in that, but I can do that kind of stuff. I mean, that's kind of where I wear, that's why I wear the leather gloves when we're playing. That's why I wear glasses like... Some people have different little, you can, you, some people could call them abilities, but the people that can do different things, it's really not an ability or anything they're proud of. It's more like a burden or a curse. And that's kind of what that thing is to me. So it's like, yeah, there's people that I can help different ways, and I will when I can, but I can't help everybody all the time. And 
that's just the way it is. I gotta be able to shut stuff off in my own mind and just quit seeing different things from different worlds that are out there. But it's what it is. All right. Well, let's. I know you don't like to live in the past, but let's. Can we go back in time? Oh, sure. sure. I want to talk about um, what it was like to grow up in Huntsville, Alabama, in the in the era that you grew up in, and the way that music was back then. Okay, sure. It's it's good from a historical standpoint. I mean, like I was born in 1962. I lived here in Huntsville. So in a way, growing up in the 70s, when you're like hitting 1972, you're 10 years old. So as you start hitting 11, 12, 13, you're really getting into music. I mean, music and horror movies, horror comics. I love all the old Marvel horror comics. There. That stuff was just really just part of my life. I mean, it was at some point you discover certain things. And I'll put this down. This part you. you discover certain things, and that's just how it is. I mean, you you. That's just what you are. You discover what you are in life, and then you move on. So, like, I discovered music. There was just a, a lot of really cool music in the '70s. It wasn't. It wasn't just segmented into genres like it is now. I mean, early Alice Cooper was great. I mean, mm -hmm. early Black Sabbath was great. There was just so much cool stuff, and even early Cheap Trick. So much great stuff. But uh, somewhere in there, when you started having the the Ramones, and I was around. I mean, I was existing, going and buying all this stuff when it came out. The Sex Pistols. It's like the punk rock stuff was immediately something that all this mainstream form of music was like, this is bad, this stuff over here is bad. So they were really vilifying it. And I think in a lot of ways, maybe the this country in particular was looking at it as like the hippie movement was kind of getting out of control. So they kind of took Manson and just kind of made it the boogeyman for all that. And they were like, well, here's another boogeyman. This is worse than the hippies. Like we can't, <laughs> we can't let this stuff overwhelm our youth again like we had then. So I think that was part of it. but. The whole aspect of just not giving a shit and going back to the the, the roots of rock and roll, all the rockabilly stuff. So I really dug that part of it, of the punk stuff. And I really dug the, the not giving a shit aspect of it and the, the pompousness of, of, of mainstream bands was pretty extreme in those days. I mean, if you couldn't do a recital of some long, vast 10-minute song, then people didn't think you were even a good musician or anything. And like, ah, that's, you know, musicians like playing the guitar, just like riding a bike. Anybody can ride a bike. You know, man, I can ride a bike like Lance Armstrong, but I can ride a bike, you know what I mean? So that's kind of was my take on it. So somewhere in that, I was digging all this stuff, and then you eventually you go through school. Like I mentioned, I got the sex, I just want to explain as hell, when I got this, I was like 14 years old, I think, when that came out. So there was a record store in Huntsville called The Night. It was on Pratt University, mm -hmm. kind of across the street from where, where Red Lobster is now. But it's like you walked in there as a kid, I'd ride my bike over there, and I would dig through, they'd have tons of band t-shirts and all the albums, you know. And so I asked them, like, can y'all get me the Sex Pistols album? Because I'd heard of them, they're on the news and stuff. So finally they got it in, so I rode my bike over there. And so when I come in the store, you know, you know, we're hot, sweaty, I think I was maybe 13 or 14, I don't know. But you open the door, and then here's these old hippie-looking people just turning over, looking at me like, Ooh. They had it on, they were playing it. <laughs> and they were like, oh, this, this is so bad, and this is so wrong. And I was just like, I just, you know, So they kid, played your you know, record before kid. you did. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they were listening to it. That's they got awesome. it in, but they were like, oh, this is so bad. And that was actually the French import, so that was the version of that that got pressed before it even got pressed and sold in England. So that was a weird coincidence, but I just thought it was interesting because I looked it's it all numbered up. numbered up there and everything. Yeah, that's, the actual, that's actually the very first pressing of that album, which is kind of cool from a historic standpoint. And the fact that somebody, you know, butthead Huntsville, Alabama, got it as a little kid is kind of cool in some way. And it's super cool, kind of prolific in a way, you know. I always think there's something really cool, like underneath the ground here or something. Oh, it is. Huntsville, Alabama is pretty, it's I a big mecca with a lot that. of cool stuff. Uh, well, um, let's talk about the knockabouts. Let's, yeah. um, so when did you become a musician? So you're obviously interested in music and, um, you know, and Sex Pistols and so on. Yeah, and just, just rock and roll. And I really like punk rock. That was the first time when you started getting albums and the, there was no commercial appeal intended for it at all. Like when you would buy even an album by early you know, Black Sabbath or whoever, there'd always be a couple little songs that, that really suck, but they were intended to be played on the radio. Right. So you're like, what the fuck is this shit? You're know, like, I like the rock and stuff. I mean, these were the first albums that I got when I was like, there's nothing on here that's, that's trying to be anything other than what it is. And so that had a pretty, pretty big impact on me because I didn't give a shit about those things either. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Probably as I finished high school, I mean, I took bass lessons. They're basically teaching me jazz, bass, which is it's a good way to learn how to learn about music because if you can play jazz, you can pretty much convert that to any type, any form of music. It's a lot more complicated than, than rock and roll tends to be. 
but then it was kind of like I just reached the point where I got out of high school. I mean, you're, you're kind of, you know, this is kind of a very different world in like 1980 than it is now. I mean, that was over 40 years ago. It was, there was no, the communication was very limited. There was no internet. There was no nothing. There was no way to find people with like minds. I just, somewhere in there, I think I just kind of snapped. And I was just like, well, this is what I want to do. This is what I'm going to do. I really don't care anymore. And uh, I had a friend that he wasn't into that type of stuff at all, but he could play bass. So I talked to him. He still went to Lee High School. We were from Northeast Alabama. And so his name's Steve Talon, still friends with him. He lives in Nashville. And so uh, he talked to a couple, other couple of kids at, at Lee, uh, Rusty Jackson, Greg Skalkin. We formed Knockabouts. They were still in high school. And so, you know, I was out of high school, so I was the older guy, even though I was only maybe 19. I don't remember. It was a long time ago. So, like, in 1981, we started that band. And we were really just kind of a weird little thing in northeast part of the city. Like, in, even though it's hard to believe, but, like, that was, that might as well, from the Grissom area, that might as well have been another country back in those days. That's what Mike was saying, too. It was really That's hard true. to get from one side of Huntsville yeah, to the other side of You didn't know anybody from there. You'd see them at a football game, maybe, and you didn't know anybody. So yeah. we were like really focused on the northeast part of the town. And then as it just like we just kept playing. Like if we first we did like any other band, we would play a lot of cover songs, whatever you like. So, you know, they kids like the Sex Pistols or the Ramones and I would get them to play more hardcore stuff. And then we would very quickly just shelved all that and did our wrote our own songs. But then we started playing more throughout town and then you discovered other bands in other parts of the of the world or the country that were doing the same things that you were doing, which was kind of amazing. You're like, well, there's these little hardcore pockets all over the country. You know, of course, they're in bigger cities, but they were everywhere. And as we would reach out to them, they were always like, oh, my God, this is in Alabama, too. <laughs> you know, which was, which was funny. Which is how we got on that barricaded suspects thing. They wanted to get captured bands that, were from, that weren't from big cities. that were places that That's nobody true. ever thought. We were actually the first band they even picked because we sent a, lot, a bunch of live stuff to them and and in those days, you actually call people and talk to them on the phone. There's no internet. There's no texting, messaging, or nothing. But as Toxic Shock Records, they they ran a store that sold. They had one in New Orleans for a while too. I think they're out of Pomona, but they had a store. They had a record label. They didn't deal with typically major bands, but those were all bands more or less from isolated Breach parts of the world. Generation. <laughs> Breach first generation. Breach Oh, yep. Yeah. Mary's Black Enology Chop. Yeah, I mean, who are those septic death? I mean, that's right. septic death still around, you know. Right? Yeah. But uh, in Roach Motel, we knew those cats down in Florida, yes. and uh, but most for the most part, I mean, that was cool. But most of them, you know, they were everybody Red was tie. a glimmer in the pan. You're a flash in the pan, and it's just, yeah. the longevity you have is really up to you. I and mean, you got to have that level of dedication and wanting to leave a mark or do something. And and I definitely had that. I mean, uh, you know, nothing lasts forever. So like even the knockabouts, you know, there's a. We were literally were the first original band in this city that so we could say we're the band that broke the mold, which hardcore music broke the mold in this country in a lot of ways because it was so extreme. It really needed something extreme to just destroy everything else. It didn't follow any other rules and didn't care and didn't want to achieve the goals that mainstream music did. That's what really opened the door, and that along with like bands like Black Flag and Dead Kennedys touring everywhere, to, to create a way for bands to go everywhere, create things they didn't have to necessarily be hardcore, but they benefited from that from that initial bust, that initial bullet, that initial shot, the tip of that spear that broke everything everybody could follow. And that's kind of what happened here with the knockabouts. It wasn't that long after that. Like, first it was just us, and there was nobody but us, literally. The other bands here were just fucking shitty cover bands playing Van Halen or whatever. Like, oh, I made a Van Halen, you know, it's, it's awful. Right. But uh, then suddenly there was, there was a pretty good bit of bands, and so I was kind of like, well now, I've got friends. I didn't have any fucking friends. They all looked at us as like, ah, we're going to be better than you and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. and I'm kind of like, I'm still alone. <laughs> still got nothing. <laughs> but it is what it is. So like we just went on for, you know, for whatever period of time. It's kind of like when you get into the middle, the mid 80s with, to me with hardcore, you had had this initial violent explosion when you were born. And then literally, not just saying you're bored with it, but you're bored with it. I've done all that fast shit. I mean, I knew how I could write that stuff all day long, but a lot of bands, and we weren't that different. We were really looking at ways to expand beyond that. That's when we started having, you know, scratch acid, the butthole surface. Just so many mm -hmm. weirder things that started coming out, and we weren't, not knowing at the time, but looking back, we weren't any different than that. So we kind of had to, we kind of had to get rid of some of the people that we played with that really didn't know how to play music, but they could just play what we showed them. Mm -hmm. start, oh, we got to deal with some people with a little bit of, musical knowledge so that's kind of when we moved into like monster dog and even that to me was initially was just a joke 
it was like, I think we got Kilpatrick, we met him somewhere along the way. I think he may have even been a senior in high school when I met Mike. But it was a long time ago when we had Wyatt from the Dead Pigeons and we still had Rusty from uh, the Knockabouts. And we just thought, we'll just create like a local fun superstar punk band for fun. No mm -hmm. pressure, you know. And then, then of course, it doesn't take that long. You start really looking at ways to make it better and then the pressure comes in and you're building something beyond just some little lackadaisical let's play a few fun songs into something big and that's just where we morphed and morphed and morphed and people kind of came and went. We actually even came close to getting signed to Warner Brothers sometime in the 90s with that. Our drummer at the time, they basically agreed to pick a producer for us and he more or less he got arrested for selling pot in his apartment. And so he was in jail. So we're like, all right, Rich, we'll like, uh, we've got this opportunity now. It's a once in a lifetime thing, but they're going to have to get a studio drummer to play. Mm -hmm. And they'll have it where when you get out, they'll already have a tour book. You just come play. And he was like, no, if you're not going to have me play in the studio, I quit. And me being the brother I am, I was like, all right, well, we're going to have to wait till Rich gets out. I'll keep going. That's oh, just how things crap. work. Crap. Yeah. That was, a, that was the 90s when people were actually making money. And then, you right? Know, oh, man. But, you know. That's yeah. Huntsville's a cool little town, you know, I mean, I look at it as like I, I might have been the bullet or the tip of the spear, but it, it busted the doors open where, you know, if it wasn't me, it'd been somebody else, but it happened to be me, so I mean, that's the, just the truth, but that's is what it is for me. Right, and there used to be a lot of, like, division based on, like, the music you listened to back in the 80s and the, yeah. in the early 90s. Like, you had the, the heavy metal, the rock and rollers, and they did not like the punks at all. So uh, you were telling us earlier about one time you guys were going to play and they had uh, the cops were out in front and stuff. So what kinds of like barriers did mainstream society put up to try to stop you guys from, from playing music? Well, in Huntsville, you got to keep in mind that it was an entirely different world in the early 80s than it is now. So like yes. I say, we're walking around putting up flyers. We're wearing combat boots. We're, you know, like you've seen, everybody's seen Survivor. They know what people really would look like or were in those days. You know, we weren't any different. We were just here. So... Then when you're out in public, you might as well be an alien. I mean, mm -hmm. so they're like, well, what the fuck is this shit? You know, I can't have this in, in my city. You know, like, what's going on here? There'd be people spray painting their names on buildings and fences. And they, so the, the cops knew who we were fairly quick. So this was just one particular show that we did. It was an all-ages show at a place called Fantasia's. It was like a, on the parkway, they had like a bunch of, an area with a lot of video games and crap. And they had a little building next door that they would let bands in, which pretty much were just us every once in a while, and they might play new wave music. So we played there a couple times. It was always fun, and the one time we played, and we were like, damn, we're playing, you know, there's nobody in here, and you know, there's windows up here, we're, you know, it's kind of like far from where we were, like, well, what's going on? So we walked up there to the window and looked out, and there, the whole parkway was lined with police cars. It was probably a dozen or more police cars with their headlights pointed straight at us. They had the dogs, they had everything. It was literally like looking at a bunch of Nazis in Germany looking at you, but they weren't letting anybody come in there. That's all it amounted to. Like nobody, who was going to come in there when you got a line of police cars out front? I mean, they would follow us around, tear down our flyers. I mean, we'd heard from a lawyer that they had all of our names on a list. Uh, if they pulled us over, uh, fuck with us, that type of thing. But I mean, but that was a long time ago. But that's right. literally how it was. When you, right. When you talked about the people, I mean, people wanted to fight you every time you went out of your house. They'd want to beat you up or just... That's just how it was. Just so. out of fear, and it was that era you where different. everything was censored, and they wanted to keep it that way. Yeah, you were just They wanted different. to keep the censorship and so on. Well, the way that I've always looked at that, like I've always been somebody that's been alone, that's always been fucked with, really, and I just, I don't even think anything about it anymore. But you just, what it amounts to is here's something here that's different. It's different. Here's this big, giant world here that people want to be part of. They're really all kind of the same. They follow a pecking order, they all like what they like, and I don't want those names, but they just is what it is. So then here comes something different. They're like, oh my God, do I like this? Do I not? I don't know what to think. I don't know what to do. I don't, if, if, it means if that's cool, then I'm not cool. I don't know what to do. So I hate that. <laughs> I hate that. Who you are? I'll kill you. I'll kill you. I hate you. And that's just that's just how it was. I mean, it's like, I don't, I don't care what you're doing. You could just not care what I'm doing, and we'd be fine. But it just is what it is. And then you know, the 90s came along, and suddenly everybody in music got along better. So. Good. Yeah, there was a rough time. I mean, I grew up more in the 90s, obviously, but yeah, there, it would, there, I'd always heard about all the rough times and rough stories. Even when I was young, there was like the headbangers and the punks. It wasn't that they always didn't get along, but they weren't the same. Like yeah, you didn't nowadays, go to nothing. the same shows, yeah. you didn't go to them. And now we book it all together yeah, and throw some nothing. hip hop in there, like yeah, all at the nothing. same time. It's weird. Yeah. It is. That's how it was. I mean, it's like the metal people, they definitely hated the punk people. And eventually, they thought, well, let's just play fast like them. I really believe metal is a very parasitic form of music. It just, 
it just merges with him. And then what you had that little period where you had the rap metal. Or, yeah. It don't matter what it is, they're gonna sure they're gonna snatch what's going on and try and pull it into themselves to survive. But that's kind of what you had in the mid '80s. Is suddenly these metal bands. Where do you think they got all that thrash coming from? They got it from hardcore bands. Like we're just gonna play fast as hell. We'll be better than y'all were. And like oh, you don't even get it. But that's just where it comes from. Mm -hmm. But anyhow, that's. That's probably more than you ever wanted to hear or know, but that's a little bit of what no, it was like. No, I mean, that's exactly, what I wanted, exactly what I wanted to hear and know. Know more about the Knockabouts, because I saw your reunion show, which was pretty great, over at the Old Straight to Ale, before mm -hmm. they moved to the new place. Yeah. And I didn't know about anything, because I'm not from here, so I only got to hear what people had told me. So. And really not that many people here saw us, just to be honest. I mean, it was just like when you look at those early shows of Ramones, there's 50 people there. It wasn't no different, you know, here or there. We played in other cities where... More people there liked us than they did here because they were bigger, you know, but right. it's just what it is, but it's just part of the city's history, so I mean, I'm, I'm glad to have been able to do a little small part of it, and I'm really glad to be able to do what I'm doing now, because, you know, it's fun, you know, and I'm still able to, so I'm going to do what I want to do as long as I can do it. Right, and is that the best part of it, that it's fun? Yeah, yeah, yeah. if it wasn't fun, I wouldn't bother, I mean, if right. I didn't enjoy it, I'd be out in a heartbeat. So what is the future for the Google Killers? What do you guys have coming up next? Let's see, you did for this is your CD. No, this one, that one that just, you guys have been work had it together for like a year, yeah, you were we saying. Were, yeah, we recorded this this time last year. That was called, uh, yeah. we had a label in, uh, in the Netherlands contact us. This was before COVID, they were like, basically like, there's really a market for what y'all are doing in different parts of the world. I mean, right. America's what it is, but other parts of the world, they still like pretty, you know, they like pretty fucked up music, you know, and that's great. And they were like, we want y'all to come over here, you know, we're going to promote it, you know, we're going to take care of it. And we're like, that's what we want to do. I want to go to Europe. That'll be fun. Because how else am I ever going to go to Europe? Plus, if I can go there and play music and meet people and have fun, and that's just, a, there's a win-win all the way around. And then COVID. Yeah. So we recorded it, we did everything we want to do, and it's just set here. So mm -hmm. we've, I went ahead and printed up some CDs for fun. And uh, so I've given them to some people. I mean, it's not for sale or anything. So it is what it is. So. That being the case, we're going to record a little EP probably around Thanksgiving. It's going to be like four or five songs on it, so that way we can just go ahead and put that out. And we've already got shows lined up going forward. Honestly, it's more than I can keep up with. I mean, we probably need a manager, but I'm kind of an unmanageable person, so that's going to be a problem for <laughs> <laughs> Jesus to do that, because nobody's going to tell me to do what you think I want to do. But we have play a Halloween in Birmingham for Burks. That's going to be fun, Franken Fox and uh, COVID. And, uh, uh, Jack Helsing's band here, and uh, nice. we don't have anything much until December. We've got Tiger Sex coming here again. We're going to do that at Shag Nasties. I, don't really I missed think. them last time. I'd like to come and see uh, them. I love Kelly, man. They're, yeah. She's just as crazy as we are. I mean, like, really what I look at is I look and say, well, where are the other nut people? It's like, well, if we I get a lot them, of them here. Yeah. A lot of them come, come visit us, man. Yeah, I mean, that's why I want to get Joe Buck yourself here. I mean, I love Joe Buck. I do, too. Yeah. I, well, I mean, we were both at this last mm -hmm. show here. Yep. Yeah. That's great. And we've got some more stuff in Birmingham and Chattanooga that's supposed to be coming up sometime in January. We're going to open the Meteors in Knoxville sometime in January. Uh, I don't remember the date, but that's already been set up. So that's the problem. Is I don't. It's, I got to have right this shit written down somewhere, but I don't all know it off the top of my head. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're doing uh, we're doing the benefit for Leda here uh, with I don't know who else playing, but I know that. Yardy Swagger is, maybe Boneyard Mafia is. I don't know if that's going to be I will definitely be at that. I'd like to help later for sure. Oh, yeah. I mean, to me, it's like anytime something like that comes up, we'll do it in a heartbeat. Same, same. It's like, any, oh, we, somebody needs something, let's let's all be there because that's what we should do for each other. Exactly. I mean, that's that's the community we have to yeah, have with one yeah, another. I agree with that. I mean, not 100%. And Absolutely. we're for the Comfort Cats here at Sidetracks. I mean, we're hitting a lot of the rockabilly bands. It's like, we're not really a rockabilly band, but. That's why we just call what we're doing wreck and roll. It has little elements of a lot of different things, but we didn't want to be limited to just saying that we're one genre with exactly one way of looking at it. We wanted to have this big of a lane rather than this big of a lane. So, but anyway, we're, we're real happy with what we're doing. I mean, we're, we're looking to do more. I mean, we've had a lot of people talk to us about videos, just doing different promotional things, but we've kind of had to hit the brakes because that album hasn't been put out and we really don't know what we're going to do with it. So we'll just record another one. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Well, that'll work. You said you've got like over 80 songs, so my goodness, you can, yeah. I'm sure, make them. How does that process work with uh, with creating the songs? Do you do the lyrics and they do the music? And Like, what is your creative process in the Go-Go Killers? Well, I do all the lyrics and I do most of the compositions. But the compositions means that, I mean, there's songs that I've written pretty much the versing chorus for. I, I, I really don't want to do a whole lot of that. Like, I can do punk songs like that all day long. But like we have a lot of people, a lot of people in the band, they're really good at what they're doing too. They know what we're doing. Like James is a 
excellent guitar and bass player. You know, Russ is, Russ is mm -hmm. just really thrown himself, from being a bass player, to throwing himself into just studying old rockabilly styles and surf styles, and he spends all this time just learning more and more about guitar playing. So uh, they, the, everybody works on riffs, but I'll have like different sections of things that I know that I want to do. Like, what we want to do, this is a little more garagey. This we may want to do some more rockabilly stuff. So I kind of keep it together where when you release it, it makes some sense. You gotcha. know, it's just not just random shit that's thrown at the wall. So like I'm kind of responsible for that or just the, the general themes of it all. But, you know, I'm not doing it on my own. I'm doing it with my brother, so we all do. I mean, Adam, he's instrumental in all of it with the drums too. I mean, all of it's important. You're no better than your leakiest, wink in a band, leakiest, weakest link in a band. If you got one person that's not happy, you're fucked. If you got somebody that can't do what you want to do, you know, you're fucked. So it's like a family or a marriage. You've all got to get along. It's give and take. Like, uh, there may come a point where you've, this is why we did that gospel album. Like, Russ had a lot of those songs he really liked. They didn't fit in with a live set for what we're doing necessarily because, like, man, we can't play some of these songs live, but they're fun songs. Let's just package them together and we'll just put them out there together. And they're cool in their own little universe, but are you going to be able to pick those out and throw them in the middle of a plant fuck and some of this other stuff? Probably not, but but they're still part of the universe that we create things in. So, mm -hmm. you know, you, you've all got to work together to, to make it fun for everybody in the band. Otherwise, I mean... Yeah, you don't want to feel like they're working through it. Yeah, yeah. It's a hard night. Like, no, it's not what this is supposed to be. This is supposed to be a fun night. It's yeah. supposed to be for yeah. us and, and connect with the audience and, and for all the people who are there. Yeah, I mean, to me, the man thought, put my suit on, put my glasses on, put my gloves on, and I'm not the same person anymore, and I'm just basically going straight to everybody there and, like, let's just have fun. Mm -hmm. like, let's just have a good time. and. We'll walk you through it and have a good time, and that's what it is. And you guys coordinate. You coordinate a lot of shows too. You guys put on Loud Fest mm -hmm. and, um, and and put together a lot of shows where you bring musicians and artists either from that are local or or usually close by Nashville and so on to come and play with you guys too. Is that? Um, I mean, I you put together some pretty good lineups. Yeah, appreciate it. And we're trying to do, I mean, another feature, we're trying to do some of the same things you're doing. What I really wanted to do is I wanted to establish a corridor down 65 from Nashville to Birmingham to just say, all of us, we should all be working together. Oh, I want one from 65, from Birmingham all the way the heck up to Minnesota. Oh, I've been yeah. wanting one that long forever because it's so easy. I mean, we could put y'all on tour for a couple weeks and back and it'd yeah. be great. Yeah. The only problem with all that is I agree with you 100% is just the money part of it. Like, I hate yeah. to have people come here. Like, I've got to pay them something. Yeah. So some yeah, people are that's like, the hard well, part. well, it's $10. Like, $10. Like, come on. You probably spent $10 at McDonald's and getting coffee today. But, but, it, but I, it's not for me. It's like, I've got to pay Kelly and them to come here. Yeah. Like, I've got to pay these cats from Nashville. Like, I give them something for God's yeah. sake. I agree. I get, I get frustrated with the, oh, it's 10 it is ten dollars, and you, yeah, you can pay ten dollars to, to. If you figure you have four bands, that's two dollars and fifty cents a band. That's nothing. That's nothing. That's nothing at all. You're gonna say that that's not worth it? Yes, right. yes, it is worth it. Yeah, yeah. That's how I look at it. I mean, and I, I can't go to everything that goes on here okay. any more than you're about, but I do it the best that I can, and you know, everybody. I look at it honestly. It's a blessing anytime somebody comes to see us. Like they, everybody's got their own lives, their own hardships, mm -hmm. their own challenges. If they want to just get away and go see any band. I appreciate that. They don't have to, you know. I mean, it's always looking like, thank you for coming. Like, for coming here, I'm going to make sure you have a good time. You know, we're going to have fun. We're going to say fuck it for a little while. Oh, that's the best part of it. Mm -hmm. Get away from everything and go and have a good time. Well, thank you so much for being here with us today. Um, I've been doing this thing, and I hope I don't put you on the spot, where it's like if you had five words to describe yourself. It just started with OJ because there's five fingers on my hand. Five words to describe Alabama Donnie. Um... Mr. Sharp, all of those things, what would you, what five words could you do with it? Damn, that's tough. I know, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Yes. Five words. I, I come up with a lot of nasty things, but I don't really want to throw any of that out there. <laughs> I guess it'd be like, it now, go, go, killers, wreck, and roll. There we go. Oh, that's Perfect. Five, that's cool. Go, go, killers, wreck, and roll. Um, make sure you guys come out and see a live show. You can listen to it on the internet, but it's nothing like seeing it live and in person. It never is. Uh, so not no for way. any band ever. No. But And they you put on a great show, and they put on a great collective of shows. Like I said, they bring out a lot of other bands to come here, too. We've been doing a lot of work. Thank you so much. I'm Selena Brilla. Alabama Shark. Woo! DIY. Matt Green. <laughs> <laughs>